The Soviet Union managed to replicate one of the most complex aircraft in the world, down to the rivet, but almost no one outside Moscow understood how or why. The B-29 was not just a bomber, it was a self-contained, pressurized fortress with power-operated turrets and nuclear delivery potential. So when three B-29s landed in Soviet territory at the end of the war, Stalin issued an order that would redefine post-war aviation. Copy everything, exactly. But what happens when duplication becomes doctrine? Few aircraft in 1945 could even approach the B-29's technical complexity, and that alone made it the strategic prize of the post-war world. The Super Fortress was not merely an evolution of Boeing's earlier heavy bombers, but a leap conceived under the U.S. Army Air Corps' requirement for a platform capable of sustained, high-altitude bombing across intercontinental distances. The specification called for a range of roughly 3,000 miles at speeds of around 300 miles per hour, with a true operational ceiling around 30,000 feet. For the early 1940s, those were astonishing figures, equal parts aspirational and experimental, demanding far more than incremental design changes from existing models like the B-17 and B-24. Boeing began the XB-29 project well before the war's outcome was certain, framing it as a hemisphere defense weapon a machine that could strike targets anywhere on the planet if the United States lost forward bases. That foresight became a guiding principle for the eventual Super Fortress layout. Its wing loading, structural efficiency, and internal systems were all organized around sustained flight in the thin air above most defensive fire. The designers introduced pressurization to bomber aviation, separating the crew into two conditioned compartments linked by a tunnel through the bomb bays. The result was an aircraft that could cruise comfortably at 30,000 feet while earlier heavy bombers were struggling for oxygen at 25. The gain in altitude handled multiple problems at once. Better fuel economy in the thinner air, eased load on the engines, and significant reduction in exposure to anti-aircraft artillery. The B-29's weapon system was equally radical. Four remotely controlled turrets covered almost every firing angle, each stabilized and directed by analog computing sites rather than direct manual operation. This eliminated the need for large, drag-producing gun blisters and made continuous high-altitude control possible. Combined with new bombing radar, the aircraft could attack through overcast skies, conditions that grounded much of the 8th Air Force's earlier campaign in Europe. All of these systems created an integrated machine where technology served not only to increase performance, but also to standardize precision at a scale no other air arm could reproduce. While the B-17 remained the public face of American air power, it simply did not have these physiological or mechanical allowances. Crews in unpressurized compartments worked under freezing conditions, their aircraft limited in altitude and payload. By contrast, the newer bomber could deliver up to 10 tons of ordnance from altitudes above most interception range. More than 1,600 examples rolled off production lines between 1944 and 1945 a volume matched only by national policy emphasis on strategic bombing. Each aircraft delivered not only conventional bombs, but also a capability later adapted to carry atomic weapons, which meant it defined the practical instrument of early nuclear strategy before any jet-powered bomber had even flown. These systems, the cabin, the turrets, and that bomb bay, became the standard every other power would measure itself against. Whether any nation could replicate it under the shroud of post-war secrecy was another question entirely. And that question became very real when three American B-29s, battered and lost, came down in the Soviet Far East. When three B-29s crash-landed in Siberia, Stalin's engineers found themselves facing an impossible order. Copy them exactly, without U.S. help or source materials. It was the kind of directive that defined the new political reality of 1945. The Cold War was still unnamed, the atomic monopoly rested in American hands, and Soviet planners feared being left behind in any contest of intercontinental reach. In that environment, the arrival of three intact superfortresses looked less like an accident and more like a once-in-a-century industrial windfall. Stalin's response was immediate and secret. Every system had to be reproduced, not interpreted, with the goal of fielding a native bomber capable of carrying nuclear weapons across oceans. Inside Soviet industry, that instruction raised a practical problem. The B-29 had been designed in inches and fractions. Soviet factories built everything in metric. A conversion chart would not suffice, because rounding a single dimension could throw off the alignment of bulkheads, mounts, or gun turrets. 
So engineers began cataloging the aircraft on the ground one component at a time. Thousands of pieces were disassembled, weighed, and traced by hand to produce master drawings. Even control cables and hydraulic fittings had to be recalculated to compensate for the minimal difference between Soviet metric stock and American hardware. The rule was absolute. Fidelity over efficiency. What followed resembled an industrial-scale experiment in translation. Wire looms were mapped like cartography projects since no technical manuals existed. Rivet rows were counted and plotted to match not just spacing, but pattern. Oxygen systems, radios, and gun turrets were stripped and measured under guard. The smallest fasteners demanded new tooling, and every supplier in the Soviet aircraft chain received copies of U.S. parts they had never seen before. In any ordinary program, designers might have simplified or substituted, but that would contradict Stalin's directive for an exact copy. The most difficult obstacles were metallurgical. Boeing's selection of aluminum alloys balanced strength and corrosion resistance in ways Soviet production could not yet match. Metallurgists tested domestic substitutes that performed close enough under stress loads while outwardly appearing identical, preserving the illusion of total replication. Entire workshops shifted to producing these semiconductors and fittings solely for the bomber project. By 1946, what began as a mechanical puzzle had turned into a national mobilization. Dozens of design bureaus coordinated to synchronize airframe fabrication, engine installation, and remote turret calibration. The effort condensed more than a decade of American heavy bomber development into two frantic years of reverse engineering. Engineers effectively learned a new language of manufacturing from artifacts alone. Western analysts doubted success was even possible on schedule, noting that each aircraft embodied millions of parts. Yet in August 1947, one did fly. Designated the 2-4, it mirrored the Superfortress almost exactly in form, dimensions, and performance. To NATO observers, its appearance signaled that the Soviet Union had mastered long-range strategic bombing and that the arms race had entered the air. The new question was no longer whether Moscow could replicate. It was what purpose that newfound image of parity would serve next. The 2-4 was more than a machine. It became the symbol of Soviet equivalence, real or imagined. In the early phase of the Cold War, awareness meant power. Every new aircraft presentation, every photograph sent abroad, served not only to inform, but to shape the emerging psychology of deterrence. The 2-4 appeared at precisely the right moment, when visibility was valued as much as performance, and when the public appearance of a rival's capability could alter defense policy more quickly than test data. Western analysts could not agree on how many 2-4s actually existed in operational form. Estimates fluctuated depending on airfield sightings, overflight reports, and official parades, which were the only reliable sources the West possessed. Yet even uncertain numbers proved powerful enough. The mere visibility of these aircraft suggested that the Soviet Union had reached technological parity in heavy bombers more swiftly than anyone expected. In Washington, that assumption hardened into doctrine. Strategic Air Command began revising contingency plans, recalculating bomber dispersal, and strengthening radar early warning networks to meet the perceived vulnerability of the continental United States. It was therefore perception, rather than the 2-4's true endurance or altitude ceiling, that drove the next stage of nuclear readiness. The aircraft's presence accelerated the development of the Strategic Air Command's round-the-clock alert posture and justified the expansion of the Triad's aerial leg. In bureaucratic language, one aircraft program forced re-evaluation of global deterrence simply by existing in quantity unknown. Although the 2-4's real range could not yet guarantee one-way missions across the Pacific, planners operated on the assumption that it could, and that assumption alone had strategic weight. Moscow understood that dynamic well. Soviet propaganda emphasized the bomber as tangible evidence of industrial maturity. Newspapers and newsreels presented long assembly lines filled with silver fuselages, projecting competence and confidence to international audiences. Inside the country, the same imagery reassured citizens that their aerospace engineers matched the West's. The irony was that by the time the 2-4 entered mass formation displays, Soviet jet prototypes were already being tested, rendering the piston-powered clone technologically dated. Yet it remained center stage because of what it represented, a proof of ability to replicate and deploy complex Western engineering under pressure. At international air shows, the 2-4 received special treatment. 
Flights of the type performed synchronized turns for cameras, often in carefully staged formations to convey depth of fleet size. Photographs of these events filled newspapers worldwide, implying bulk production levels that did not yet exist. Each appearance reinforced the same message. The Soviet Union could field a strategic bomber fleet equivalent in scale and presence to America's. The technical debates about engine efficiency or fuel consumption mattered less than the visible silhouettes on the horizon. The Soviet clone of the B-29 was more than a technical feat. It served as a mirror reflecting the ambitions and anxieties of both nations at the dawn of the nuclear era. Each rivet represented not only industrial determination, but a political assertion of equality disguised as engineering. In that mirror, the United States saw its own technological lead narrowing, real or imagined. For the Soviet Union, imitation provided the shortest path to deterrence, proving that capability could be performed even before it was perfected. In aviation history, true innovation sometimes begins with an exact copy of someone else's legend.